Good morning. Give thanks to God, for God is good. God's steadfast love endures forever. It is truly good to be together for worship. In our State Street family, we've got folks gathering for worship in person. We've got folks connecting with us online, both in our community here and even beyond this community. What a blessing to be able to claim one another in Christ and to have so many ways to stay in touch. We've been looking together at how God can take the broken pieces of our lives and shape us into something beautiful. As we are finding our way home, as we are coming back together, maybe as, ev as we are even making new connections, I'm looking forward to seeing how God is shaping us through this what we are becoming as we emerge from these challenging days. Let's prepare our hearts for worship as we share together in our call to worship. Turn away from anxiety and worry. Repent, Repent and, and turn, turn back, back to God. God. Turn away from shame and guilt. Repent and, and turn back, back to God. God. Turn away from prejudice and judgment. Repent and, and turn back, back to God. God. As we enter Lent, may we turn back to God. May, may we, we seek, seek forgiveness. May, may we seek healing. May, may we seek wholeness. May, may our hearts be renewed in this time of worship. worship.
may not be in the same room together, but that does not mean that we cannot uphold one another in prayer. We claim one another in prayer. We remember our connection with God and the way that God is able to keep us connected. Let us pray. Merciful God, we confess the folly of our sin, the hypocrisy of our complaints. We grumble about the evils in our world, even as we commit injustices and profit through deceit. We fret about the scarcity of resources while hoarding earth's goods and cheating those in need. We protest the problems of our world, but we do not actively work to address them. Merciful God, expose our sins before the light of your grace. Heal our sin. Free us from our foolish ways, that we may know the joy of eternal life in Jesus Christ. Holy God, you created us in Christ Jesus for good works. Help those who profess faith in Christ to do good in the world, following the way of life you have prepared for those who believe in him. And we do pray for the church of Jesus Christ, both here and in all places where there are those who seek to follow you. God, your reign encompasses all the earth. Though the nations may rebel against your justice, save the nations from the wrath of their own disobedience. Help them to dwell in peace and to promote the common good. We do pray for all governments, for all leaders. We pray for their hearts. We pray for their spirits as they bear many burdens. You hear the cry of the sick and the afflicted. Save them from their distress. Heal them of their disease. Deliver them from the destructive power of suffering. And we take time, gracious God, to lift up prayers that each one of us have on our hearts as we turn to you. We offer all of our prayers in the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, and we join together in praying his prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you for sharing of your resources, for the ways that you are supporting State Street as we seek to be the body of Christ in our community. Let us pray. Merciful God, accept these offerings with the dedication of our lives and help us to be for the world a witness of your steadfast love. In Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.
I'll be sharing two scripture readings today. The first is from the book of Genesis, chapter 3, verses 8 through 14. Hear the word of God. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the, in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman who, whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent tricked me, and I ate. And then hear these words from John's Gospel, chapter 14, verses 15 through 21. Jesus says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, because he abides with you, and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while the world will no longer see me, but you will see me, because I live. You also will live. On that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. They who have, the com have my commandments and keep them are those who love me. And those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. And now may the words of my mouth and may the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh God. You are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. One of my dreams as a young child was to be an Olympic swimmer. I guess it probably started when I was five years old and I watched Mark Spitz win seven gold medals in the 1972 Summer Olympics in Munich, Germany. I swam all the time. We had one of those small portable pools in our backyard. I swam in the pool on the campus at Emory and Henry College. I was in training. I would swim laps. I would imagine all the crowds cheering. I, I could picture them putting that gold medal around my neck. I even continued my training in the bathtub. Somehow, I could get my small body to make turns and circles even in my bathtub. Now, there was one problem with my bathtub training. I made a mess. My splashing around would put water all over the floor, and my family would get pretty irritated with me because we just had one bathroom that we shared among us, and it was not very pleasant to come to the bathroom and find water all over the floor. But I would get in trouble, but I wouldn't stop. They just weren't understanding my dreams. Finally, my mother had enough. She pulled me up out of the bathtub, sat me down, and explained very forcefully that I was not to come out of that bathroom until I understood the trouble I was causing and made a promise that I was going to stop. I can remember sitting there a pretty long time, or at least what seemed like a long time to a five-year-old. I cried, I pouted, I yelled, but then I just started feeling very alone. 
I didn't want to be there anymore. And I didn't want to cause trouble for my family anymore. And so I opened the bathroom door and I walked down the stairs and guess where my mother was? She was sitting in the rocking chair waiting for me. I guess she had been sitting there the whole time listening to my crying and my screaming and my pouting and waiting for me to find her. And all I had to do was curl up in her lap and rest in her arms, and she rocked me until I felt better. This has always been a powerful image of grace for me. Grace that came when I took responsibility, and grace also that was waiting for me ready to receive me and help me live a more grace-filled life of my own. What happens to us when we fall from grace? The season of Lent is about remembering that we do all sin, we do all fall short. We all need the salvation that Jesus offers to us. None of us have it all together. We all need God's mercy, and thankfully, that mercy is always there. The story from Genesis that was shared is also about a fall from grace. We name it the original sin, the first fall from grace. This fall comes in the context of creation and the glory of creation. God has provided incredible grace, has filled the world with boundless wonder, with vegetation and creatures of all shapes and sizes and human beings created in God's very own image. And relationships are a key part of that wonder and that plan. God chooses to make room for more than God. God provides a partner for the first human. It is not good to be alone, God says. God asks human beings to tend to the rest of creation, to take responsibility for all that has been provided for food and for care. It's a garden filled and overflowing with grace. But we human beings fall short. We disobey the boundaries that have been put in place to protect us, to help us thrive. We decide we would rather be God. We eat the fruit that we're not supposed to eat. We give in to temptation and suddenly we find ourselves afraid. We feel naked. We are exposed. We try to hide. In the story, God seeks us out. God looks for us. God wants to connect with us. And it doesn't look like that desire from God is rooted in judgment. Even though this disobedience has happened, we don't see this angry and vengeful God that comes down to strike us. Instead, we see a God who is seeking us out, calling us from our hiding places. But when we are given the chance to ask for forgiveness, when we're given the chance to admit that we've messed up, we keep falling short. In fact, Dorotheus of Gaza, who is one of the early church fathers, argues that the most serious mistake that Adam and Eve made was not their first, that is, when they ate the fruit from the garden. Rather, it was in their refusal to take responsibility for what they had done and to say that they were sorry. When God sought them out, there was no sign of humility. 
On the contrary, the man tried to shift responsibility to the woman. She made me do it. In fact, the man even got a little dig at God and said it was the wife that you gave me that made me do it. We say those kind of things, don't we? Your child didn't clean their room. Your dog made a mess. And the woman continues in that same pattern. It was the serpent who made me do it. And that, Dorotheus argued, was the original sin and failure. That was the time where we missed out on grace. The thinking is that if Adam and Eve had stepped up and admitted that they had done wrong, if they had been honest with God and continued honoring one another, God stood ready to forgive ready to help them be restored. We see this same pattern in Jesus. Jesus also makes clear that he takes responsibility for us, just as we have already seen in the garden. God, we see in all of these pictures, remain, remains in relationship with us doesn't just create us and then leave us to ourselves. God keeps tending to us. Jesus shows us that picture in John 14 when he says, I will not leave you orphaned. I'm coming to you. God's presence, God's responsibility always remain. In God the Father, we see it. In Jesus, we see it. In the Holy Spirit, we see it, all signs of that ongoing presence and connection and responsibility. As Reverend Shane Stanford shares in his book, Mosaic, when God uses all the pieces, God invested himself directly into our journey and even gave the life of his, his only son to ensure our safe passage. Jesus has taken the responsibility of our safety, of our care upon himself. And this is what it means to be in relationship with God. And Jesus challenges us that we need to have that same kind of relationship and sense of responsibility and connection in the ways we are accountable to one another and with all of creation as well. Reverend Stanford talks about how we come into this world needing someone to love us, to tend to us, to tell us that the dark shadows are just that, to reassure us that mourning will come soon. We need people to live up to their responsibilities to be faithful. Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And just like the original commandments and direction in the Garden of Eden where humanity was given the task of tending to this wondrous creation, Jesus reveals that the centrality of the commandments that he offers, all the commandments really are to love, to tend to one another in love. The Bristol paper last week had an article about a ministry developed by Faith in Action in Abingdon. Partnerships have been formed between local restaurants and families who are facing food insecurity. The restaurants are providing meals that are boxed up and distributed directly to those in need. And the really neat thing is that this ministry goes much deeper than charity or a quick kind of fix. It's not just about addressing hungry stomachs for a meal or two. The ministry is an example of community shared responsibility because the restaurants are benefiting as well. They are receiving financial support to be able to offer these meals. And this comes at a time when they too have been struggling to make ends meet, where their business has been suffering. The ministry 
helps keep the restaurants afloat and keep their employees working. So the grace overflows from all corners. The families feel special as they receive a restaurant prepared meal. Brad Farmer, executive director said, their faces light up when we tell them we're giving them meals from local restaurants. We've had several families call us after receiving the meals and thank us for blessing them, for blessing them with this generous food. The chefs, the owners, the servers are blessed to be able to keep busy and to do what they long to do, to share the joys of food and fellowship and eating with others. One of the restaurant owners shared, we're able to help out people and at the same time, it's helping our restaurant. This is an example of how we can live out who we are created to be. When we recognize the responsibility we have and carry for one another, we are built, designed to need each other. We find the depth of our meaning and our purpose when we do tend to our relationships with one another. Many times it takes admitting our faults with one another, offering forgiveness to one another we realize our fullest potential when we share in the mercy and grace that comes from our grounding in one another. And that's how we experience the power of grace when we love one another. Another of the restaurant owners summed it up well. I think it's important for all of us to step up and help wherever we can. We are all in this together. We see this at the very heart of creation. We experience it in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We continue to be called to it through the power of the Holy Spirit. This is who we are. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, we pray for those places where we have not lived up to our responsibilities, where we have let down those we love most or where we have failed to be obedient to you. Give us courage to hold the banner of grace and forgiveness high. Give us compassion to meet the needs of those who hunger in body and soul. We love that you see us so differently than we oftentimes even see ourselves. Thank you for taking this broken, jagged piece of our souls and for creating a beautiful masterpiece in Christ. Amen.
As we all head out to face whatever this week may bring, I invite you to remember, remember the responsibility that God and Jesus Christ bears for you. God longs for you, God seeks you. In God is where we find grace. In God is where we claim and find love. And with God's help, we are able to share and show love. We never need to walk alone. And I pray that the Lord may bless you and keep you. I pray that the Lord may make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. I pray that the Lord may lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.